Welcome everybody um, to the uh, the presentation today. Um, we're going to be discussing the largely the zero tolerance uh, policy and the enforcement thereof by the ATF. Um, and, and time permitting, and I think we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, to touch on the recent rulemaking 2021 R05, um, the identification of frame or receiver and definition of firearm that I'm sure that many of you have heard about. Um, with that said, I would like to um, allow a moment for a representative of um, Siler Shop to, Silencer Shop, excuse me, to make some introductory remarks. Um, so Chris, I will turn it over to you. I believe you have the capability to, uh, to unmute yourself. And if not, I will unmute you. Great, thank you, Phil, I appreciate it. This is Chris Bowick, General Counsel for Silencer Shop. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you to, to you, Phil, and to ORCID for putting on this important presentation. And a great thank you to those who are here today. At Silencer Shop, we've got more than 4,000 dealers in our network, and so we, we work closely with them. And I've had an opportunity over the last few weeks in particular um, to talk with a number of FFLs in different states who are going through inspections currently or are in post-inspection uh, talks with ATF, uh, a few of whom are going through revocation proceedings, unfortunately. And uh, the, these are dealers who have been through the inspection process before. Many of them have uh, great relationships with their IOIs or had historically, um, they've been confident in their compliance practices. And the overriding message I'm hearing <clears throat> is that this is, this is a new ball game. So now is the time to tighten up your compliance policies and familiarize yourself with the, the current focus areas the ATF is looking at, um, the expectations of this administration's DOJ and ATF. And what Phil and Orchid are doing both today in this presentation and in general in their assistance to the industry has never been more critical. So thank you again, Phil. I really appreciate you doing this and I'll let you get to it. Absolutely, thank you, Chris. Excellent. So um, uh, I am Philip Milks, uh, pleasure to speak with everybody today. I'm with Orchid Advisors um, as the, the leader of the, the regulatory services um, and also the uh, lead attorney with FFL Law. Um, a little bit about ORCID. Um, most of you likely know us as a um, you know compliance advisory firm, and you know that is what we started off with, and that is obviously my prime focus. Uh, we do offer FFL um, technology solutions to the industry um, that do help people remain compliant um, and you know process all of their transactions in a compliant fashion. Um, so, without much of a sales pitch, if you wanted to read more about ORCID. Um, or FFL law, feel free to visit any of the uh, various websites. Um, again, okay, well, so again, what we're going to discuss here briefly, um, the Biden administration's zero tolerance policy. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it says versus what it means. And, you know, obviously what, what someone or something may say versus what they actually mean can very often differ. Um, and there can be, you know, subtext to each of these statements. And you will see throughout this, uh, this deck that there is some subtext to each of the various um, um, uh, elements of the zero tolerance policy. Uh, go through some anecdotal examples of what we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis in the industry um, that'll provide some more context to, to the uh, zero tolerance policy. Um, obviously, after that, we're going to talk about, you know, how do you protect your FFL in the current environment? You know, it's always been important to operate in a compliant fashion, regardless of the administration in, in office, regardless of the IOI you're dealing with, regardless of who's the head of the ATF, right? Um, you know, these are legal obligations that we have to follow in order to remain in business. Um, but it's especially important from a practical perspective everything is under the microscope these days. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what willful versus intentional means. Um, we're gonna talk about some recommended practices to, to implement in your businesses. Um, I'm not going to go through, I'm sure, you know, some of you may have um, joined some of our past webinars or our, our past conferences uh, where I've talked at length about how to establish a compliance program and operate a, a compliance program. I'm not gonna get into all that in detail because that's 
that's an hour or two discussion in and of itself. But I am going to hit some highlights that should help. Um, talk about a little bit about online sales and the applicability of other states' laws. Um, and I'm going to talk about compliance investment. And you know, obviously, in the context of the main bullet point there, how to protect yourself. Um, and obviously, as we're getting together today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rulemaking. It is going into effect very soon, um, August 24th. Um, so I'll hit a summary of that at a high level, talk about the frame receiver, 80% in solvent traps, um, talk about the new markings, obligations, and a little bit of the record keeping obligations as well. Um, so we won't be going into great length on that rulemaking. I'm sure many of you have likely attended some form of webinar, whether put on by NSSF or, or ORCID. Uh, we've done several of those, or you attended our conference. Um, and I do want to provide some for some Q&A. Um, so again, I will ask that any of the questions that you would like to have answered, um, enter that in the in the chat function, please. Again, we have we have too many people to hoard, uh, orderly <laughs> discussion uh, via phone. Um, any that I do not address, we will try to get out um, via a, an email to everybody that's attending. Um, so um, another quick introductory note before we get into this, and I'm obligated to say this, and you'll see the footer at the bottom, but as an attorney, I have to say that this presentation is for informational purposes only. Um, nothing in here is to be construed as legal advice. Um, attending the presentation, listening to me drone on for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, including asking any questions and any responses that I may provide, uh, do not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney client relationship. Um, and obviously for any legal advice, you should consult with a qualified attorney. So that mumbo jumbo out of the way. Um, <clears throat> the zero tolerance policy, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard it, but what is it? So the zero tolerance policy that is being enforced by the ATF is part of this uh, Biden administration, quote unquote, comprehensive strategy to prevent and respond to gun crime and ensure public safety. So that's a mouthful, right? Um, there are a whole host of initiatives that the Biden administration launched last year, last June 23rd. Uh, you may or may not have seen it. They were out on the Rose Lawn and you know, talking at length, Biden and the Attorney General about what they were going to do to stop um, you know, gun crime. Um, as part of the quote unquote strategy, um, they established this zero tolerance policy um, for an enumerated list of certain violations of the regulatory requirements. And what effectively the policy is, is, you know, even if it was an inadvertent uh, violation of these actions, um, if it was completely accidental, if the local office didn't want to issue a revocation notice, and I'll get into that a little bit further later, does it matter that the, the Department of Justice um, at the direction of the Biden administration and through the ATF has said, any one of these, you are to revoke a license with no questions asked. And the zero tolerance policy, I hope this is not in the way. Um, as stated by the Biden administration is this couple blocks of text right here. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read through this. Um, you know, everyone everyone can read it on their own accord, and I do have a link available at the bottom um, if people wanted to visit and read the uh, bureaucratic language of that memorandum. Um, but suffice it to say, the Biden administration says, "quote unquote" establishing zero tolerance for rogue gun dealers that willfully violate the law. Okay. And you'll see within this block of text, there are five, um, five bullets for which the ATF said, these are your quote unquote, five deadly sins. And the violation of any of these, even one will subject you to a revocation proceeding. So um, for those of you who might not be viewing the screen, those five are transferring a firearm to a prohibited person, failing to run a required background check, falsifying records such as a firearms transaction form, failing to respond to an ATF tracing request, 
And the fifth one, refusing to permit ATF to conduct an inspection in, in violation of the law. So while those seem relatively straightforward, um, there's context to be added to those and something that you might not think actually is one of these results could fall within one of these five different categories and subject you to a revocation proceeding. And again, I'll go through a couple of anecdotes here after we walk through these. Um, so getting into each of the five violations. So revocation basis number one, transferring a firearm to a prohibited person. Sounds relatively straightforward. And the first one def definitely is. So transfer a firearm after receipt of a denied response. Obviously nobody is to do that, right? Um, <clears throat> The second one we have seen uh, is transfer of a firearm to an individual who responded with a yes to any of those prohibited persons inquiries on the 4473 um, to exclude any of the exemptions for certain business practice felonies um, and exemptions for non-immigrant aliens um, that permit them to, to purchase firearms. Those business practice felonies are identified on the 4473 itself. But Scenarios like this would arise where, you know, a uh, firearm is being transferred, transferee completes the form and answers yes to one. And I've even seen all of the uh, prohibited person's questions answered with a yes. Employee is not paying attention, doesn't review the respondent's answers, goes ahead and transfers the firearm, right? So ATF comes and if they're reviewing your 4473s, if they see a single prohibited person's question responded to with a yes, and that firearm was transferred, your license is going to be subject to revocation. Again, this is a single violation of these. The Biden administration has said we're issuing revocation notices. Um, another lesser example might be a transfer of a firearm to a person who is visibly or clearly under the influence of a controlled substance while they're in your uh, facility, right? So, um, you know, we're not, we're not drug experts, but maybe there is reason to believe that a uh, person in your store is, again, visibly or clearly under the influence of um, some form of drug, including marijuana, where it is legal, either medicinally or in the recreationally approved states, right? Um, you know, maybe, Maybe there's a, a visual component, maybe their eyes are bloodshot. Uh, maybe there's a certain aroma uh, that they carry with them into your facility. And you know, you might ask, well, you know, how is the ATF going to know that, right? Um, how would they ever discover that? Yeah, maybe a person came in high and I, I transferred a firearm to them. Um, you know, and for if it's not purposeful and you were unaware, you know, you can't be held accountable for that, but you never really know how the ATF becomes aware of these situations and how I could come back, right? You know, maybe, um, maybe somebody used a, you know, a, a firearm that was purchased in the commission of a crime, um, whether it's the day after or that night, maybe weeks or months later, and there is, you know, video footage of your store subpoenaed, right? Um, you really never know how these um, things are going to come to light. So, you know, that's a little bit of a, you know, more off the road example. Um, you know, the, the takeaway from this is, you know, ensuring obviously that all of those prohibited persons questions are reviewed very closely um, by any of your employees who are transferring firearms. And if I take an awkward, awkward pause, I'm just uh, grabbing a, a sip of water. So <laughs> excuse me for that. All right, revocation basis number two, um, failure to run a required background check. Um, more to it than meets the eye, right? So I guess second bullet point there, failing to perform a background check at all, that's very straightforward. If you, if you have to run a background check and you fail to do it, ATF is going to revoke your license, okay? Um, a little bit more nuanced um, violation here and one that has been popping up pretty frequently over the course of the last several months. I've had a, a few clients come in um, that this was the case, and I'm aware of a few other from a couple of other attorneys I've spoken with, but um, the 30-day the limitation on the validity of that NICS check, right? You know, if, if you're not aware, you're, the, the NICS check is only valid 30 days from the date you con initially contacted NICS. 
okay? Um, firearm wasn't transferred that day for any number of reasons. Maybe you got a delay response. A uh, customer could have said, well, something popped up, I gotta run out, I'll, I'll come back and get the firearm later. Maybe they didn't have enough money to pay for the firearm at that point, right? It could be any number of reasons the firearm's not, tra not transferred. Um, if 30 days go by from that check date, that check is no longer valid and a new one has to be performed prior to that transfer. Let's say you receive a proceed response six days after, um, you know, you initially contact the NICS. Doesn't matter if it's past 30 days from when you contact the NICS, that is no longer valid. And if that occurs, you're going to get a revocation notice. Um, I, one of the clients that came in to us, um, theirs was, it was 32 or 33 days. I mean, it's just past that date and they got a revocation um, notice issued to them. So be, be acutely aware of that time differential uh, when you contact next and when you transfer the firearm. Uh, another instance of failing to run a background check is use of a um, CCW in a state where the permit doesn't qualify as a NICS exemption, right? I'm sure most, if not all of you are aware that certain CCWs or license to purchase um, or permit to purchase or whatever the term may be in your applicable jurisdiction serve as an exemption to a NICS background check, okay? Not all states' permits so qualify. Um, you have to be aware of whether your state's does. Um, you should refer to the permanent Brady permit chart on the ATF website. You should check that periodically because it does change and states are removed and added to that. Um, probably two to four years ago, there was quite a bit of jostling of states on and off that list. I don't believe there's been any change in it the last perhaps a year and a half to two years. Um, but again, make it a habit of checking that every, um, you know, maybe every month, uh, every two months, every six months, whatever the case may be. But you gotta be aware of if your state went off of that list. Even if your state's on that list, another basis for uh, failure to run a background check is CCW that was issued more than five years ago. Um, if the CCW, even if it's valid, maybe the CCW is good for seven or 10 years, maybe it's a lifetime CCW. If it was issued more than five years ago from when that purchaser signed that section B to purchase a firearm, it does not qualify as a NICS exemption and you have to run your NICS um, background check. And for those who are in POC states or partial POC states, every time I say NICS, I'm also referring to you know, state background checks. Another failure to run the background check, um, confusing CCW reciprocity with the CCW NICS exemption laws. They are separate and distinct from one another, right? So um, had a client come in and they don't know, you know why they thought it um, or how they came to the conclusion, but they did confuse the two and they unfortunately accepted CCWs from other jurisdictions. Um, to serve as, you know, the background check exemption. Obviously, you know, the CCWs were all recorded. Um, you know, it was right on the form there for the ATF to take a look at. So that, you know, pointed out to the ATF right there, you know, violation of, of several instances, right? Um, so it's, again, reciprocity does not equate CCW exemption. And lastly, another example is a background check not conducted when there's a GCA firearm appearing and an NFA item appearing on the same 4473. Um, if, you've, if it's only NFA items on there, great. The background check was done pursuant to that approved form four, but you add a pistol, rifle, revolver, or any other GCA um, non-NFA firearm, background check has to be conducted on that Again, excluding the case where they have a CCW that is valid um, in the state. So all of those are examples of quote unquote failing to run a background check, even though one might have been done. Um, the third basis for revocation um, of the, the five um, is falsifying records, right? You know, obvious and apparent record modification um, is, you know, very easy to understand. You know, you 
put something incorrect on the form purposefully, you know, that's a falsification of a, of a government required record. Um, other example of that, which is far less harmless um, and done accidentally is, you know, if you conduct, or excuse me, if you perform an improper record uh, correction, that can be construed as falsifying a record, quote unquote, right? Um, obviously, especially on the form 4473 dealing with transfers of firearms to consumers. Um, but the ATF has set out guidance um, very specifically on how to correct a record, right? So if we're not following those um, specified methods of record correction, uh, the ATF could construe that as falsifying a government record, okay? Um, so it's, it's very important that those are done, those corrections are, are performed properly, whether it's paper, whether it's electronic. Um, the next two are a little bit more nefarious. Um, they have happened in the past. I haven't seen any um, coming through my door, but these are examples of you know a, a record falsification that have landed people in court. Um, a proceed is marked after the receipt of a, uh, a denial response from NICS um, or the state POC, or the firearms were added to the 4473 after, after the customer has left the store. So these are more um, involved with, you know, theft by an employee, um, whether it's just for themselves or whether it's involved in some kind of arms trafficking. Um, but these are obviously very difficult to uncover and that's why it's important to have compliance um, uh, procedures in place, which we'll talk about later. But, you know, even if you conduct a, uh, you know, inspection of yourself, you know, you might not discover these because if customer to this uh, fourth bullet point completes the 4473, uh, your employee, you know, signs off, disposes of the firearm, customer leaves the fire, customer leaves the store, excuse me, um, later on, employee adds a firearm to that, to that same 4473, dispose of, disposes of it in the A&D book to that same individual. You know, when you conduct an internal um, audit of yourself, you might not even discover that, you know, you're not going to find that likely until you're looking at financial records to see why your, um, you know, why your, why your financials are off, right? Um, so these are difficult to discover and that's why it's very important to have a very holistic audit procedure in place um, and to obviously know and trust your employees and why it's very important to have multiple employees involved with any given transfer as well that can help avoid issues like these excuse me and the last one uh falsifying records nix information or exemption information added after the customers left the store this can be more nefarious as in the case of the prior two examples, or it could be an example of employee panics. They forgot to conduct a NICS check or they knew the person had a CCW. Um, they forgot to enter it when the person was there. And then later on they enter it and it's incorrect information. You know, if that is uncovered um, in some way, shape or form, that would be a, a record falsification, right? Um, so those are some examples of falsifying records that we've either seen recently um, or in the past that would subject you to uh, a revocation. And I know that these are all really touching on the 4473s, um, but you have to be aware that this really could apply to um, any record that is required. Could be, you know, if you, if you falsify a and book entries, multiple sales forms, whether rifle or handgun, theft loss reports, NFA paperwork, you know, anything required under regulation to be retained um, has to be completed fully and accurately. And you should not be making any uh, improper corrections or changes to those after the fact. Fourth revocation basis, um, again, issued by the, the Biden administration here, failure to respond to a trace inquiries, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, failure to respond within 24 hours could serve as a basis. Maybe you call back 30 hours later, um, you know, if, if you've done that enough times or if there are other violations that are present that your local field office is not happy with you, they could say you failed to respond within the lawfully required time frame. Um, and that could serve as the basis uh, for revocation. And then obviously failure to respond at all, right? 
Um, so it's, it's very important to respond to trace inquiries when they come in. Um, and note, a couple notes here. Even if you, you go through your records, maybe the ATF shoots you an email with a trace request or they leave a voicemail, you don't speak with them. Um, they ask for a serial number that according to your records, you have never received. Um, you still have to respond to the ATF and provide them that, that information that you never received that firearm. Um, a couple scenarios listed there where that could occur, theft loss in transit. You know, maybe you don't notice that uh, you ordered a firearm, it never came in. Um, and in a short period of time, that firearm was, you know, used in the commission of a crime. Trace goes to the manufacturer. He says, oh yeah, I dispose of it to Bob's gun shop. ATF calls you at Bob's gun shop. You don't have any record of receiving it, but you never respond, right? You, you have to respond to the ATF and tell them that that never came in. Um, same thing with wrong gun inbox, right? You could uh, receive a wrong, wrongly labeled box. Um, I'm sure some, or maybe even many of you have from a manufacturer, serial number A23 on the barcode, but serial number A24 is in the box. Um, and maybe you even called the manufacturer and told them to update their records, but you know, they make mistakes too. They are human. They might not have updated their records. So they still provide them the trace information to you, right? Um, so kind of beating that horse to death, but uh, <laughs> if you never receive that firearm, you gotta provide that information to the ATF. Um, and this last note, if you're, you know, more so for the smaller businesses, you know, if, you, if the contact information you provided to the ATF is no longer valid and they, you have to update the ATF, right? They have to be able to get a hold of you. Um, you know, changes in contact information for, you know, companies like, you know, Smith & Wesson or Colt, the ATF is going to be able to track them down, right? But if you are, um, if you're Phil's gun shop in, in the mountains of Tennessee um, and I don't update the ATF with how to get a hold of me, um, and I miss a trace request and I don't get that to them within that 24 hour time frame. that's going to be an issue in their eyes. Right. Um, so, uh, for those of you that would be in that, you know, small to mid tier, make sure that that contact information is accurate. Excuse me. And revocation basis number five, pretty straightforward, a little bit of nuance failure to allow ATF to perform their compliance inspections. Right. So there's a couple different variations of this. Um, number one would be the, the probably a nuclear option. You're not coming into my premises. Um, if you are prepared to lose your FFL immediately, you can do that. But an outright refusal uh, will re result in a revocation proceeding. Um, refusing to provide records that are required under the GCA and the NFA to facilitate their inspection. Um, again, they are entitled to those records, um, so you have to provide those. And refusal to provide access to areas in which your physical inventory is stored, right? So most of you probably know, um, so I won't belabor it too much, but some of you on here might be new. Um, the ATS permitted to perform a one compliance inspection per year, and pursuant to that compliance inspection, they are entitled to access your inventory and the records that are required under the GCA and NFA. Um, so only once a year for a compliance and inspection that is you know, not a criminal inspection. That is different. Criminal inspections, they can come on premises with a subpoena, right? Compliance inspections, FFLs get one a year. Unlike FELs, FELs, explosives licensees are subject to more, um, but FFLs we have you know, the fortune to only have one a year. Um, I will say during the course of these compliance inspections, um, there is anecdotal examples of ATF IOIs asking for more than they are lawfully entitled to. Um, whether it's a good idea for you to provide the documentation that they're asking for, or whether it's a good idea to refuse, um, there's no really wholesale statement that solves that. It's kind of an ad hoc situation. Um, if, for example, they're going through your records and if you're a manufacturer and there's 50 firearms that are missing from inventory and you know maybe, there, maybe it's 50 machine gun receivers that are missing from inventory, right? That's gonna be a very big issue to the ATF. But maybe you have documentation of a work order for the destruction of those 
um, and somebody just you know neglected to put those dispositions of destruction in the A and D book, right? Um, that'd be a scenario where it is a good idea to let the ATF have more than they're entitled to, right? Um, things like commercial paperwork that have no relation to any discrepancy um, that contains you know sensitive business information, whether it's pricing or or anything related to your customers that they might not be entitled to, you know, that's something you're probably going to want to push back on. And, and if you get those kind of requests, um, obviously you have to know your rights, what they're entitled to. And, you know, if you feel the need, you should either, if you feel the need and you're uncomfortable, you can just defer and say, I believe I've provided you everything that I am obligated to provide you. Um, I understand what you're asking for, and I'm going to respectfully uh, discuss this with my counsel. Um, and if you don't have counsel, you can thereafter go and procure counsel uh, to discuss the matter with them, right? Um, so there's a couple different variations of um, failing to allow them to perform an inspection. It's not necessarily not letting them on premises. There could be a different uh, refusals that would subject you to <clears throat> excuse me, this, this type of violation. So, hmm. a couple of answers, uh, or excuse me, a couple of examples of what we've seen in the past couple months uh, to within the past year, like just kind of little, add a little bit more color. Um, first one for transferring a firearm to a prohibited person. So, I wasn't the um, counsel of record in this. I uh, had a, another attorney contacted me. Um, he was representing an FFL retailer and he wasn't very experienced in you know, FFL laws um, and the ATF regulations. So he contacted me to consult for him. And in this situation, FFL answer, excuse me, aired in the transfer process. Um, and it ended up being a prohibited person may or may not have probably likely did end up with the firearm. So adding a little bit more color to this situation, the, the husband here won a firearm in a raffle. He was at a, some event, a charity event, won a firearm in a raffle. You know, he was convicted of a felony a very long time ago. Um, won the in raffle, gave him the FFL to ship it to. Um, obviously, the per people putting on that event sent the firearm to that FFL for the transfer. Um, husband goes there, they get a delayed response. Um, eventually, they get a denied response. FFL calls him and says, hey, can't transfer the firearm to you. Um, you know, you've been you know, denied by Nick. So the husband and wife go in and he talks to the FFL. This is a very new FFL. He'd been business a little bit less or a little bit over a year. He says... Hey, I won this at a raffle. Um, you know, can my wife have this instead? So, I mean, obviously a little bit sketchy, but this was not, again, an individual that went out and sought to purchase a firearm. He, he, he won something worth monetary value um, as a prize. Um, so the FFL was like, eh, I, I, I think, I guess I can. So he 4473s it to the wife, Nick's check, proceed, good to go. And they, they you know, they walk off with a firearm. He felt a little funny about it. So he contacted the local ATF office to discuss the situation. Um, the local IOI was like, yeah, that really shouldn't have happened. Okay. Um, so they worked together. They got the firearm back from this couple. Um, so we don't have a firearm out in the wild anymore with a prohibited person, but obviously the genie was out of the bottle. We did have a transfer that the ATF considered a straw purchase. Um, needless to say, as I put here, the, the ATF revoked that license. Okay. Um, so again, this is an example of somebody going out of their way to contact the ATF to say, was this right? How do I fix the situation? If it's not right, ATF walks them through, they get the gun back. So this guy's going out of his way to abide by the law. They end up revoking the license. Um, as I stated, I, I didn't handle the defense on that. I don't know what, what ultimately ended up with that situation and, and whether they're in court now against the ATF. But the last note I'll add on this that might make you uh, a little bit shocked or make you roll your eyes or give you a headache. This FFL, it was a side business for him and he was a police officer. So the police officer who held an FFL was told by the ATF, 
even after you called us to rectify the situation, you willfully broke the law. This police officer that's you know risking his life on a day-to-day -day basis. So pretty egregious scenario, but that just is one glaring example of the lengths that the administration is going through to revoke FFLs at this point in time. Um, the next one I already kind of touched on in the beginning, uh, transfer indicated yes to a prohibited person question. FFL's employee didn't know it. We got a proceed response. I should say they got a proceed response. This was not a, an ongoing client of mine, but they got a uh, proceed response, transferred the firearm pursuant to the NICS response. ILI noticed it during an inspection. ATF said he transferred a firearm to a person that you had reason to believe was prohibited because they indicated they were, and you still transferred the firearm, right? So even if you get a NICS response that is proceed, there are certain failings with the background check system, whether it's performed by NICS or whether it's performed by a state POC, they don't have all of the data that every individual government agency has and, that, and hospitals may have, right? It's a, it's a flawed background check system as, as probably most of you know. Um, so again, do not rely on a background check response, review those responses of the individual very, very close and when you're performing those background checks. Uh, I touched on this one as well before, um, misconstruing the NICS exemption and the CCW reciprocity, but adding a little bit more color here. When the ATF found that out, um, the ATF told my client that they ran background checks on all the individuals who they transferred firearms to, and every single background check came back that the person was not a prohibited person. So they all had valid CCWs, not one of them was a prohibited person. So there is zero impact to public safety in this circumstance. But again, another thing, you can't put the genie back in the bottle on these transfers. ATF revoked the license. Um, and the last one is an example of a complete mistake. Um, FFL inadvertently shipped receivers directly to a non-FFL. Um, receivers were shipped back the individual. So client got the firearms back um, and ATF ended up revoking the license on that as well, right? So again, no actual impact to public safety. We got the firearms back, but, you know, you had an employee on the shipping dock who was looking at, you know, paperwork and there's a bill to and a ship to on here, bill to consumer, ship to FFL. That person wasn't either educated enough or trained enough in the system. An accident was made and the ATF is revoking the license for that willful violation, quote unquote, willful violation, right? So, um, you know, again, accidents happen and some accidents can result in a revocation. So what can we do to protect um, your FFL? And for, for most of you, you know, your livelihood, um, your main source of income in the light of this, you know, zero tolerance policy. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through a, a whole creation of a compliance program uh, because frankly, I'm going longer than I had hoped to at this point. So I'm going to try to speed it up here. So an important note at the outset, very important note, again, willful, as it applies to willful violation, does not mean intentional, okay? Um, so willful is a, a legal term of art in this context. Um, so if you perform an act or series of actions that are intentional, and you have a result that you want to bring about that is in compliance with the law, but the actual result is a violation of the law, the ATF and you know any attorney essentially can have, can argue that that is a willful violation. Again, willful does not equal intentional. Um, so going back to that last example I just showed you, right? You know that employee wasn't willfully violating the law. They probably just you know misconstrued the address. Certainly, the responsible person was not willfully violating the law. Somebody on the shipping and receiving dock was accidentally shipped to the bill to instead of the ship to, right? Um, so it's, it's very important to set up your business, uh, to create an atmosphere that is going to utilize everything you have at your disposal to create, um, you know, a ongoing operation of compliance, right? So employee education is imperative. People have to know what they don't know. Um, you have to put in processes in place in your uh, environment that are easy to follow and are very repeatable. 
utilize technology um, to the extent possible. And again, you have to monitor yourself or hire someone to monitor yourself for you. So some, some recommended practices um, that can greatly assist in the, in the current environment. I, I largely touched on them, but just to belabor the point a little bit more. Technology is mostly your friend. Um, almost every revocation that I've seen come through our door lately has been based on a 4473 issue. And most, if not all of them would have been prevented by the use of an electronic 4473. So there's many electronic 4473s out there. Um, ATF has a free 4473. Uh, Orchid Advisors, our e-bound book has a 4473 integrated into it. I'm sure there's many people on here that are fast bound, easy bound or FFL boss customers that have 4473s in those um, software programs. And they all have some form of compliance controls in them. You know, everyone's gonna be a little bit different than the other, but please, please, please use those. Um, again, simple mistakes that yes, uh, that somebody responded, they were a felon or whatever, and it was a single yes. I believe every 4473 commercially on the market would have prevented that. And this person actually was using an electronic A&D book software, but they were not using the 4473 in it because they thought it was too slow and it slowed down the transfer process. Well, would you rather have a transfer take another minute or two and listen to a consumer complain about having to type something into a computer or would you rather be subject to a revocation proceeding, right? I think we all know the answer, right? So for the love of God, especially in the current environment, you know, do your research, look at 4473 options available. They're more imperative now than ever and, and use them if you have an electronic software that it includes it. And as well, um, you know, the, the manner of implementation of technology, if, if you are switching from one electronic system to another, or you are switching from paper to electronic, it's very important that you handle that conversion in a compliant fashion, because if you don't, you can create issues for yourself where none previously existed, right? So if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, hire an expert to do it for you, somebody who is uh, an expert in regulations uh, more so than technology because the technology provider can you know, tell you how to set up the software, but have somebody that's well-versed in the regulations assist you with that conversion. Um, I, I've seen many, many times where people converted the software and hundreds, thousands of issues were created by converting to the software. Um, I've run test runs of data for our clients who tried to um, convert to their uh, new system. We always put it in a test environment before we do. And in their test environment, you know, tens of thousands of issues, right? So very important that that conversion is handled properly. Establishing a documented compliance program um, that is going to include A, both policies and B to the next bullet point, easy to follow procedures for your employees, right? Now, this is more on the defense aspect of a revocation. Obviously, if, you're, if your employees are following your SOPs, you shouldn't end up on the, the defense aspect of anything. But should you find yourself on the wrong side of a revocation proceeding, if you've got a compliance program in place and, and you get to court, um, if you get beyond your ATF hearing, yes, the hearing uh, before the ATF who revoked your license and you have to proceed before them, before you get to district court, yes, that's how the system is set up. Um, if you get to that court level, having these compliance programs in place is an explicit mitigating factor in the United States sentencing guidelines when it comes to um, violations of regulatory requirements, right? It's not going to be an absolute shield, but it does mitigate, excuse me, mitigate any insinuation of willfulness. Because if you put this in place as a responsible person, after you're, you're trying to not willfully violate the law, right? Um, you may think you're too small to have a compliance program. You're not. Your compliance program doesn't need to be this very large set of hundreds of pages of documents. Um, it can be very small. If you're a one man shop, you could have a checklist um, and an overlay over a 4473, for example. Um, you know, that would suffice for one man person. Obviously, larger corporations have, 
you know, dozens of policies and tons of SOPs for everybody all across the facility to follow. Um, so have, have documentation of your program in place. Implementing redundancies is going to help uh, avoid violations. Um, this applies to both individual tasks like conducting a 4473 transfer, right? For example, and I believe I've already said it a couple of times now, um, you know, having multiple employees involved in that transfer. Um, you know, four eyes are better than two eyes when it's come to reviewing paperwork and make sure there's no violations. So have redundancies for that task, but also have it for a redundancy for employee function, right? If Sue usually handles your A and D books and she's making all your acquisitions and dispositions, maybe Sue wants to go on vacation to the Bahamas for a week or two, right? So there's gotta be some other employee ready to perform that function when she is going out of town on vacation, right? So make sure you're having redundancies and, and, and functions across your, your company as well. And lastly, but certainly not least, monitor and audit your environment repeatedly. Um, you can do this internally with your own educated internal resources, or you can hire an advisor. Um, you know, there are law firms and consulting firms that do this. Obviously I am part of one, but there are others out there available, um, that can come in and audit your environment. And I know it's an expenditure, um, but expenditure is good for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you have independent eyes discovering issues, which you know maybe you made, and maybe you don't see them on the second time through, but an independent party can come in and say, oh, well, look at this. You know, there's a lot of issues that you can correct before the ATF comes, correct in a lawful fashion, that won't subject you to revocation, right? Um, so it's, it's very good to audit yourself um, in some form or fashion on a repeated basis. All right, very quickly on interstate commerce, um, it, it, it's important to note that, you know, some of you may not know this, if you are engaging in interstate commerce, which almost everybody on here is, I will, well, I'll say everybody on here is, um, any state you're operating in, that state's laws apply to you. If you're taking an order from somebody out of state, is the item you're shipping to them lawful? Is the firearm legal? Is the magazine in there legal? You need to know that. Um, if a resident of Iowa goes to Nebraska to buy something, is the FFL in Nebraska aware of any restrictions on firearms, magazines, state licensing requirements? Does that person required in that other state? My state doesn't have a licensing requirement. Does their state have a licensing requirement to buy a firearm? Is there a waiting period to buy a firearm in that state? Is there an extended waiting period if I get a delayed response? Is there a, a seven day waiting period instead of the federal three day waiting period? You have to abide by all of those requirements when transferring to residents um, over the counter in permitted transactions. And again, you shouldn't be shipping out of state to someone who might've purchased something from your website that's not even compliant in their state, right? Um, so be knowledgeable about all of those laws. and. I won't get too detailed in this. So just uh, some of you may have seen in the news these placa targeting or, or placa avoidance laws that are being passed by multiple states. Um, New York just recently passed one. California has one in place as well. And what these laws are doing are attempting to obviously avoid the protections of the uh, protections of placa, protection of lawful commerce and arms act. Um, that shields FFLs from litigation when somebody criminally uses a firearm, right? There's various forms or fashions of these laws. Um, California is going to require that upstream FFLs monitor activities of downstream FFLs, not even just shipping a gun to them, but how was that FFL downstream operating on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so there's un other industries that are required to look at downstream um, retailers and now in some cases, the firearms industry is going to be subject to that pending litigation, of course. Um, so we'll see what happens with that lawsuit. But you know, given that these placa targeting laws are, are being passed in several states and there's probably another half or dozen or better states, laws like that are currently pending, it is imperative to be aware of the laws in other states when you're dealing with residents of other states and shipping guns and firearm parts and ammunition across state lines. 
All right, so compliance investment and applicability to the willfulness standard. Like I said before, um, I know it costs money. If, well, if you're gonna bring in somebody outside, I know it costs money. Um, if you are going to hire a compliance employee, that's obviously gonna cost money, right? It's not always a zero return investment, right? It doesn't have to be. And I know that oftentimes people do see compliance as a, um, a necessary appendage um, that is, you know, a, a sunk cost, uh, but it doesn't have to be. I've encountered to this next bullet point, multiple FFLs who can sell and ship to consumers in other states, but they just don't do it because they're not sure uh, what's permitted. Uh, but if they get a knowledgeable resource in-house, they can be sure of what's permitted and they can open new sales channels to themselves and, you know, sell in those states, right? Um, so there's an example of where it could be, you could recoup some of that, um, you know, investment in labor. Um, technology investments. I, I talked about uh, 4473s and a and books, electronic technology that will, you know, save you the ultimate cost and save you your license. Um, but if you implement regulatory controls into your, maybe in your ERP or WMS systems, um, that can reduce cost by automatically restricting shipments. Um, at, at, you know, you consult with somebody, they identify where, you know, items are prohibited from being shipped. You put that information in your system. You don't even have to think about it um, for the time being and system just eliminates that thought for you and you can continue shipping to the, you know, the lawful jurisdictions. Um, uh, technology will also reduce cost and, you know, re-reviewing re for, you know, two, three, four times a 4473 um, performed on an electronic software system. I'd still recommend two resources at the transfer point, um, but it's going to reduce um, the issues that you have to look for on those 4473s. Um, the next one kind of gets back to that defense mechanism I talked about before. So, you know, investment in labor, whether an internal resource or outside counsel demonstrates to both the ATF and a court of law, your intent to purposefully avoid willful violation, right? Um, so if you get in that defensive posture, obviously you don't want to be there, but if you do end up there, you know, investment in labor is going to be a mitigating factor in those proceedings more so in the courtroom context, unfortunately, because again, your initial hearing is going to be before the ATF, the agency that revoked your license in the first place. Um, but once you get to that independent arbiter, um, it's going to assist with that defense. And then your investment in time, you know, internal auditing, you know, hopefully everyone here is doing it minimum an inventory of your um, physical goods on a periodic basis. Um, depending on your size, that should be, you know, maybe quarterly, semi-annually, annually. I know some clients of mine that do it monthly, 100% physical inventory. Obviously, that time period is going to, you know, vary based on your size. But internal auditing, going beyond your physical inventory, like I said, going to your records, you can uncover errors and you can fix some errors in advance of the ATF arriving. And those ones you can fix, are they are going to help you in this current environment now for sure. Some you can't put the genie back in the bottle, going back to that one example I had of transfer to an improper person, even though the good came back, license still revoked. So some things are not correctable, but there are a lot of issues that you can correct in your books. So I went far over the time that I had um, hoped to do so there. So I'm going to try to be extremely brief with the rulemaking um, and only because, like I said, it is going to, into effect in a few days and it is going to affect everybody in the industry. So I'm gonna to try to get through this in the next seven minutes and then um, hit some of these questions that I see that have come in the chat function. Mm. So the title of it, definition of frame or receiver and identification of firearms, there's a lot more than that. So we've got new definitions, new exhaustive definitions, new examples to illustrate those. We've got exclusions um, from those definitions. We've got rescissions of prior determinations of classifications. I'm trying to go fast, excuse me. There's new marketing requirements for all FFLs, not just manufacturers and importers. Retailers do have marking obligations under these new rules. Um, 
it loosened up some marking obligations for WIP among manufacturers um, of firearms and silencers. We've got specifically identified marking requirements for silencers, finally. Some cases good, some cases bad. Um, we've got destruction requirements now. Previously, there were only four firearms that were by ATF ruling identified a specific method of correct, or excuse me, destruction. Now we've got all firearms have to be destruction the destroyed according to these requirements. Um, formalized or codified marking time periods. So ATF ruling 2012-1, um, that has now been rescinded and replaced by the new regulatory requirement. Um, same thing for record consolidation for importers and manufacturers. Uh, rulings 2011-1 for importers, 2016-3 for manufacturers have now been rescinded and they are now mandated to consolidate their records of acquisition and disposition. And we now have permanent record retention requirement for dealers as well. Here's an example of a number of the new definitions. We've got a new section in the regulations, 478.12. These are very important. Familiarize yourself with these um, new requirements. 80% firearms, quote unquote, and solvent traps, quote unquote. Long and short of it is there in the bold. Anything the ATF had previously, ident previously identified as not a firearm, um, i.e. doesn't have to be serialized, can ship directly to consumers. Anything issued in the past are all now rescinded uh, or revoked. They're not valid or authoritative after April 26, 22, which has already passed, okay? Um, anybody that wants a new determination or classification, obviously they're probably going to have to modify the item um, and, and ask the approach the ATF for that request. Um, any FFL can do it. Presumably the manufacturers for obviously re obvious reasons are going to be you know, requesting those of the ATF. There is a new definition of readily, quote unquote, and a quote unquote aid to help the industry and design new products um, I'm not optimistic that many unregulated products are going to be able to be designed. So here's one of the examples, you know, uh, AR lower, you know, with the jig partially milled out already before it comes to the consumer. We've got a solid fire control cavity here. Doesn't matter. This is a frame of receiver and is now regulated. Also, um, you know, regulated a partially complete frame of receiver with, and this is very important, quote unquote, one or more template holes drilled or indexed in the correct location. One or more holes drilled or indexed. So it would seem then Magwell was previously, you know, milled out before. Under this definition, that is a no-go anymore. Again, if you want to sell something unregulated, it's very important for your own defense um, to approach the ATF for a new classification. Um, this third one is just frames of receivers that haven't been destroyed according to the new requirements are still regulated. So if I, if I chop a frame into one, two pieces, you know, that is still a regulated item according to the ATF now. Here's an example of not a receiver. Um, this image is not in the new rule regulations. Uh, it's in a guidance document. The ATF has issued several guidance documents, but a billet or blank of an AR-15 variant with essentially nothing milled out and sold without any jigs or instructions is not regulated, right? So without the ATS explicit determination on any given item, if you wish to sell an unregulated item, this is your safest bet, absolutely nothing milled out, you know, we're molded to the correct shape, but you know, buffer threading, magwell, fire control area, uh, front area, nothing is milled out at this point. And then the same thing for AKs, um, the flat of an AK variant receiver without any cuts, without indexing um, is also not regulated as well. Really quickly on grandfathering, um, the new definitions of frame or receiver would change what is the frame or receiver for these firearms. Um, ATFs recognize it's been such a longstanding practice to use that euphemism I used before already, can't put the genie back in the bottle. So the frame or receiver of all of these that has existed in the past continues to be the frame or receiver moving forward. Under the new ruling, the upper for the AR would be the frame or receiver, but it, this is grandfathered, bleh, grandfathered 
the lower it remains the primary receiver. Sorry, I'm trying to go quickly here. New marking requirements. Any new model of firearms has to be engraved with serial number, name, and location on a new model of firearm. There's ambiguity with respect to what is a new model that ATF is yet to clarify. Um, so I'll bring that up. And there's ambiguity with respect to the name and city state on polymer firearms. It's very likely that they are going to require that the name and city state be on a piece of metal embedded permanently in the polymer firearm as is done with the current serial number plate, okay? Multi-piece receivers, not split receivers like an AR upper and lower, but a true multi-piece receiver. Um, the piece that is visible on the exterior has to be engraved with the applicable markings. Um, it's a little bit confusing. I'm not gonna get into many, much more detail than that because it's gonna extend the discussion larger than I want to. Um, parts defined as machine gun or silencer have to be marked, registered and transferred in accordance with the NFA. That's always been the case, but they did clarify exemptions for silencer parts shipped amongst FFL SOTs um, in the context of repair, i.e. manufacturer can ship baffle stack to retailer um, for the retailer gunsmith to repair an item and um, silencer manufacturer can source baffle stacks from another FFL SOT that other FFL SOT doesn't have to sterilize and engrave it prior to shipping it to the manufacturer okay um, they eliminated the 2009-5 notification for any manufacturers on here most likely um, you know anodizers is the kind of the most typical example so named manufacturer ships firearm receivers to the anodizer, that anodizer no longer has to complete those 2009-5 notifications, which was very welcome for many people I know. And they clarified that if importer receives a duplicate serial number from a foreign vendor, they can modify that so it is no longer a duplicate serial number. Don't destroy or erase or you know mill that off, add a digit to that um, serial number to make it a new serial number. For retailers now, if any FFL takes a privately made firearm, like an 80 percenter that somebody made with no serial number into inventory, it has to be marked with a serial number consisting of first three last five of FFL number, followed by a dash, followed by a new unique serial number. So if you don't have the capability to do that as a retailer, you can take it to another FFL to have that done, or you have to, if you're bringing it in for repair, in and out of your facility in the same day, that exemption will still imply you don't have to acquire that on your books. If it's in and out same day, which means you don't have to add this new serial number on here. But in any other circumstance, if a retailer is bringing in a privately made firearm into inventory, it's gonna stay there overnight. They have to have that engraved with their, <clears throat> excuse me, first three, last five, and that serial number. And again, if it's polymer, that has to be on a piece of metal permanently embedded into the polymer, which is gonna cause some issues for people. Um, that has to be done within seven days or prior to disposition of the good. And anything in inventory now has to be marked within 60 days after August 24th, 2022, when the new ruling goes into effect. Silencers, tubes have to be serialized. Silencers using modular design have to be marked on the part that mounts to the firearm, excluding any accessory, i.e. like a flash suppressor um, that is used to mount it. So, you know, that back portion of that modular silencer is the one that has to be engraved. GCA items, seven days to mark. NFA items by the close of the next business day. So you can register it on a form too. The new requirement here that gives people more flexibility is that seven day and that close to the next business day are from when the entire manufacturing process has ended. So previously for any manufacturers, as you know, or maybe for some of your newer manufacturers that might not have known, if I make a frame or receiver and it's fully machined in-house prior to the effective date of that ruling, I have a firearm in-house. So I've got seven days to get that unfinished frame or receiver, unassembled finished for frame receiver, I got to get that marked within seven days from right now. After this ruling goes into effect, I now have seven days from when the firearm is completely assembled, right? So what does this do? This gives more flexibility with whip goods, right? Nobody's going to wait until everything is attached and everything is assembled to engrave the firearm. But I know a lot of manufacturers that had to go out of their way 
to serialize and engrave WIP. And this is now uh, removing that requirement and giving a little bit more flexibility. Talked about manufacturer consolidation. I also referenced A and D, or excuse me, dealers now have to keep their A and D book in forms 4473 permanently. So no more of the 20 year rule or the five year versus 20 years for those 4473s. And you know, this last point doesn't, the ruling doesn't require it, but my recommendation is any record related to the A and D book, you also retain indefinitely, right? So your theft loss forms, um, NFA outgoing forms, your multiple sales forms, anything that's going to touch or be related to that A and D book, retain that indefinitely. So I'm sorry I have gone over. Um, I am going to get into some of these questions right now and we'll see if we'll get a few answered. I know for you on the East Coast, it's late. Um, so I'll get into a few of these for the next few minutes here. WIP is uh, work in progress, just an acronym for any parts or materials that are in the manufacturing environment that are, are not complete. So, you know, all the, the, the bits and bolts and screws and nuts and barrels and receivers, anything that's in process uh, referred to is WIP. So again, with respect to that, manufacturers now have more flexibility um, with respect to their serialization practices. Is the upper for an AR-15 going to now be required to be serialized? No, sir. It will not be required to be serialized. Um, just rehashing that briefly, the under the new definition, it would be required if the ATF didn't grandfather it. And the ATF thankfully did grandfather the AR-15 lower um, as the part that was is going to be required to be serialized moving forward continually. If any one of you may recall in the notice of proposed rulemaking that came out last year, there was information in there that was going to seem to indicate that the ATF was going to require both the lower and the upper be serialized with the same exact serial number before they went out the door. Thankfully, they took into consideration the comments that were submitted um, and it will remain the case moving forward that only one part of every firearm has to be um, serialized with a um, serial number and for new models, quote unquote, the manufacturer's name and location. Um, one part is the receiver. If the one receiver this is the only disclaimer. If the one receiver is made up of multiple parts, and the example the ATF gives is an AR-15 receiver that's been split down the middle um, to be modular to some extent, presumably, but if you have one receiver split into multiple parts, and when you put those parts together, it does make one receiver, both of those pieces would have to be serialized with that same serial number and manufacturer's information. So again, summarizing that, uh, upper for the AR-15 doesn't have to be serialized. 80 percenters need to have a serial number added by August 1. It is by 60 days after the ruling goes into effect. Um, so calculating that, that is October 23rd or 25th maybe, um, something of that nature. So that is 60 days. Um, after the new ruling goes into effect um, that the PMFs or the 80 percenters have to be um, marked. If proof of address does not get put on the 4473, is it revo revocable for the FFL? Um, so I'm gonna say yes and no. It can subject you to revocation in so far that any willful violation of the GCA can render you subject to violation. Um, it is not one of the five deadly sins, quote unquote, um, that, the, that the ATF has issued, um, but it, it has always been the case that a single violation of any requirement of the GCA would subject you to revocation. Now in the past, obviously the ATF never enforced the law and the regulations that way. Um, but there have been some instances, even going back, you know, 10, 20 years where there was a single violation, ATF revoked the license, 
Um, you can go view court cases. Um, it's a couple out of, it might be the fifth or sixth circuit where the court said, it, it doesn't matter. The law says one revocation can serve as proof and we are holding that one revocation, um, or excuse me, one citation, excuse me, um, can serve as the basis for revocation. So it's not one of the five deadly sins. It should be corrected, certainly. So if you've got a 4473 that doesn't have that on there, that address on there, I would get that consumer back in the store, make a copy of that page, have them make the correction to that copy, they're going to sign and initial that correction on the copy and then attach that copy to the original 4473. Machine guns briefly caught sight about components that relate to a machine that needs to be serialized. Aside from a machine gun receiver are specific components needing to be serialized. So if a machine gun is distributed outside of the manufacturing facility, it has to be serialized and registered, right? Easiest example of that, drop in auto seer, right? I get this part, it's gonna convert something into a machine gun. I gotta serialize and register that before I transfer it. Now, most manufacturers um, have many components that they aggregate, obviously, to convert something into a machine gun. You know, in that instance, in your manufacturing environment on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't have to go through and, you know, serialize those machine gun components, right? Those are going to be part of a singular finished good, finished machine gun that you will ultimately serialize and register. Um, so drop in auto sear, yes. Um, a parts kit, maybe you're selling it to law enforcement, you're selling a, a parts kit. Um, yes, that also has to be serialized, registered, transferred on the form five to law enforcement. Hope that answers, <clears throat> excuse me, hope that answers that question. North Carolina is a legal hemp smoking state. How do we distinguish if we can only smell but no bloodshot eyes, impaired, et cetera? So I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't really help you there, right? Um, that, that's gotta be, you know, your own, your own judgment, right? If you believe they're under the influence of marijuana, um, or you may suspect, um, maybe it's not the best idea to, to transfer the, the gun to them, right? Um, so, you know, I, I'd say be cautious and careful. You've got to, you know, evaluate, um, you know, everything at your disposal and kind of use your own judgment, unfortunately, in that circumstance. Um, is it advisable to note for my IOI that I'll be out of the country for two weeks in the fall, home-based FFL, and I will not be available for an inspection? It's tough to answer this. Two or three years ago, I had a scenario where client was in somewhere in, um, I don't know, somewhere in the Caribbean and they were on vacation and they got a call and ATF said, hey, we're here for an inspection. You know, where are you? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on vacation in the Caribbean. And the guy told him he had two days to get back. Um, to be subject to that inspection. Um, so you would think that being a good citizen and notifying them, hey, I'm going to be out of town. If you want to inspect me, maybe wait till I get back. Um, you would think that that would help the situation. But again, you're never, you're not knowing who you're dealing with in the current environment. Um, you might think you know your IOI, but you might not really know them. And they might say, huh, sounds like a convenient time for me to be a pain in somebody's butt, um, right? So I, I can't really tell you one way or the other um, on whether you should tell them that or not. You know, like I said, you would think that they wouldn't go out of their way, but with this current administration, I have seen so much. Um, and something I haven't touched on, which, which I should have, and I, and I meant to earlier on, um, and this is a, a very important and critical point. If you haven't heard, there were inspections that were conducted previously, let's call it six, nine, 12 months ago, and that inspection was closed. Maybe the FFL was issued just a ROV. Maybe the FFL did have a warning conference, but inspection closed, paperwork signed off by the FFL, 
paperwork signed off by the ATF. We are done with this inspection. Six, nine, 12 months later, same FFL who had that inspection closed gets a revocation notice in the mail. And this has not just happened once. This has not just happened twice. This has not just happened three times. I've probably had three or four um, potential clients knocking on our door that that's happened to. I spoke to the NSSF and they are aware of other companies that that has happened to. Um, so ATF is going out of their way to revoke licenses for, um, for inspections that were already closed. And, and I shouldn't necessarily always say the ATF because like I said, this is being driven by the Biden administration. There are a lot of ATF IOIs and I'm sure many of you have talked to some IOIs who are even gun nuts um, and they love guns, right? Um, but they are doing their job. They do have a job to do. This is definitely an administration driven policy that is being pushed down through the DOJ to the ATF. Um, additionally, what I have also seen very recently, revocations based on issues that the ATF saw previously at a facility, the FFL was not issued a citation for that issue that the ATF saw. ATF comes back for another inspection, sees the same issue, revocation notice has been issued, right? So obviously being an attorney, you know, I'm you know, very risk averse, um, especially on behalf of my clients. And I always say just because the ATF didn't issue you a violation last year, two years ago, doesn't mean that what you're doing is correct. You know, I'm going, I go 75 miles an hour to dinner tonight on the highway, it's 60. You know, I'm probably not gonna get caught several times. When I do get caught, I, I'm still speeding, right? So just because something uh, was not issued, um, just because you did something for which you didn't get a citation issue before, it does not mean it was right. It absolutely does not mean you're safe, um, especially in the given environment, even moving forward. I'm sure you have heard new ATF director was confirmed. His background is in prosecutions, which probably should not surprise anybody. So I continue to believe even after the Biden administration, the ATF will be in that more adversarial revocation mode with a prosecutor at the head who has been tasked, you know, pretty much his entire prof professional career with you violated the law and prosecuting you for doing so, right? Whether it's inadvertent, inadvertent slash quote unquote willful, willful or intentional slash quote unquote willful. Um, and grandfathered AR-15. So the, the grandfathering of the AR-15 receiver just means that um, under the new regulations, the AR-15 upper receiver would actually be the item that would have to be um, serialized and engraved. But the ATF realizes that these things have been around obviously for decades, we're not going to change that. So the ATF grandfathered the lower receiver as being still the receiver that has to be um, serialized and marked and engraved. Uh, I think we got a last question here. Does the gun log need to reflect frame or receiver with a subsection of one or the other? Um, the new regulations do specifically state that frame is for handguns and handgun variants and receiver is for long guns and long gun variants. Um, so yes, I would strongly suggest if you've got you know, a pistol frame, revolver frame that you identify it as frame. And if you've got a shotgun or rifle frame, you identify it as receiver. Obviously, as we all know, next question is AR-15 receiver or you know, any other platform, most other platforms, it can be a handgun or a long gun, right? Obviously, traditionally, most of those multiple configuration could be long gun, could be um, handgun. Most of those platforms were originally invented as one or the other. And I suggest, you know, using that original um, configuration. So you get an AR lower in, I would put receiver, even if you end up converting it yourself to a, um, to a pistol. 
I'd leave it on there as receiver. When you do your conversion, you do your change in form there. So, all right, well, um, I'm gonna cut it off there. Um, I see someone just entered the waiting room. I'm going to apologize to them. Um, so again, we are going to make the, the deck available um, and hopefully I can get this recording online before too long as well. So um, you saw my contact information there. Um, obviously it'll be in the deck as well. So again, thank you for everybody. Um, Silencer Shop, thank you as well. Um, I hope everyone has a good day. Uh, you have any questions, feel free to contact us at ORCID. Um, and again, just leave you with, please, 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 please pay attention um, to all of these you know, existing compliance obligations and especially the new ones because the ATF is, is revoking licenses. So take care everybody, have a great day.